You'll be shocked, but during World War II in Nazi Germany, they created a cannon that fired 7-ton shells. Moreover, it required an army of several thousand people just to operate it. In this video, I'll talk about the most interesting secret developments of the past. And you'll also learn how in England they came up with a giant aircraft carrier made of ice and sawdust. Enjoy watching! To start off this video, I would like to discuss one remarkable development by Soviet scientists. Even in the last century, during the Cold War between the USSR and the USA, military engineers were developing new weapons to strengthen their armies. In the Soviet Union, developments were also advancing rapidly. And alongside nuclear weapons, guided missiles and advanced tanks, there were also plans for highly ambitious projects. One such project was the Soviet laser tank. Yes, you heard it right! It's the real deal, straight out of the future and movies. Although there were some differences, but more on that later. It didn't make sense to develop such technology from scratch, since there were already existing tanks that could serve as a basis. That's what the design bureau decided to do. They took the chassis of the T-80 tank as the donor. It had quite impressive characteristics. Good frontal armor, an engine with almost 900 horsepower, a top speed of around 37 miles per hour and a range of 310 miles. And all of this with a weight of several tens of tons, a real monster. So the designers took the tank's hull without the turret, reinforced it and attached their own turret, in which they installed special equipment, namely an unusual power unit that could easily power a residential house, 15 special lenses and laser installations. Thanks to this equipment, the tank could use its laser to hit any vehicle at a distance of up to 6 miles. However, the system didn't work quite like it's portrayed in movies. The laser didn't melt metal, destroying enemy vehicles in a matter of a second. They simply disrupted the targeting and viewing systems of the vehicles and blinded the crew. And this method of combat was very effective. The Soviet laser tank could single-handedly destroy an entire platoon of tanks from a huge distance. After all, nobody can fight blindfolded. Unfortunately, for unclear reasons, the project wasn't adopted for military use. Perhaps there were problems with its production, or maybe something else happened. Shortly after rejecting the technology, the project was closed, and all the information was classified. Personally, I think such technology is too inhumane. The next astonishing machine on my list is the Soviet artillery installation 2B1 Oka. During the standoff between the USA and the USSR, nuclear weapons were considered the most formidable armament. But with the power unleashed during detonation, the question arose – how to deliver the warhead to its destination? There were various delivery methods. And at a time when guided missiles hadn't yet appeared, Soviet engineers developed a special self-propelled artillery installation that could fire such shells. Its technical characteristics amaze me. This mortar was loaded with shells that were one and a half feet long. The firing power was so high that a thousand-pound shell could travel a distance of 27 miles. And due to the lack of a recoil mechanism, the vehicle literally moved back 15 feet at the moment of firing. Actually, this detail was its main flaw. They based this self-propelled artillery installation on the chassis of the heavy tank T-10, onto which they mounted a 65-foot-long cannon. The heart of this vehicle was a V-12 diesel engine with 750 horsepower. But even such power didn't allow the 2B1 to move freely. The thing is, the weight of the vehicle reached a whopping 55 tons. And the protruding cannon, which hardly fit anywhere, didn't add to its maneuverability. The gun itself could fire only once every five minutes. Such immense power played a bad joke on the self-propelled artillery installation. Due to the enormous recoil, which was almost unrestrained, the vehicle simply couldn't handle it. The transmission constantly broke down upon firing, which was used for aiming. The suspension also broke, causing the tank to simply fall on its belly. The machine literally fell apart every time it was used as intended. Because of this, the project was abandoned. However, some specimens were still produced, and these vehicles were even in service from 1957. However, the music didn't play for long, and due to all the problems I've already mentioned, the vehicles were abandoned just three years later. Many will say that Soviet scientists were true geniuses, 
since they created so many interesting developments. But personally, I've noticed that fascist Germany had far more ambitious projects. And there's plenty of evidence for that, because after World War II, German scientists went on to develop weapons and missiles in countries they had fought against. But the projects they implemented for Hitler are astonishing in their characteristics. Take, for instance, just one mouse. That's what they called the heaviest tank in the world. In German, it's simply called Maus. Its development began in November 1941. However, during this time, only two machines were created, and both were destroyed by the Soviet Union's army in 1945. However, the Soviets decided that scrapping the tons of iron left from this behemoth would be inhumane. So they collected parts from two units, reconstructed one of them with high quality, and sent it to stand in a museum. And here I would like to brag a bit, because I've seen this tank in person, and it simply amazed me with its scale. However, as far as I know, it has been sent for restoration, so at the moment you can see this monster in person. Now let's talk about its specifications. The weight of the machine is a staggering 189 tons. Its armor thickness reached up to 2 feet in some places. Actually, it's this armor that resulted in such enormous weight. All this was done to counter the Soviet tanks, which had quite effective weaponry. Although even a 4-inch gun could penetrate its armor. But the Soviets learned about this only after capturing the equipment. The armament for this super-heavy tank was quite ordinary, no more than 6 inches. The shells for it weighed a lot, around 154 pounds, which led to a low rate of fire. And even the huge and powerful 1000 horsepower engines couldn't efficiently and quickly move this monster. Its maximum speed was 12 miles per hour. And for just 6 miles off-road, the vehicle consumed 350 liters of fuel. By the way, it was kind of hybrid. The engine powered generators, which then provided power to electric motors that propelled the vehicle forward. Naturally, such dimensions played a nasty trick on the vehicle. During tests, one of the units got stuck in the mud. So much so that it took about two months to free it. And it was also very unreliable. The engine constantly broke down, as did the transmission. So, in fact, the project turned out to be unsuccessful. Although I personally liked it very much. But why talk about boring super-heavy tanks that didn't even have time to see combat? There are far more interesting inventions from the time of World War II. Now, can anyone explain to me what this thing is for? The Schwerer Gustav, a colossal artillery gun created in 1937 in Nazi Germany. And its dimensions personally greatly impressed me. The self-propelled artillery installation, also known as Dora, moves on rails because wheels simply couldn't withstand this machine. Just listen to its dimensions. Length 150 feet, width 23, height 36. And all of this is pure metal. So the weight of Dora is probably astounding to everyone. A whopping 1350 tons. Essentially, it's a huge building on wheels, which also has a gun. Speaking of the gun, the barrel length is 100 feet which is much longer than that of the Soviet 2B1. The shells fired by Dora are also much heavier and more powerful. The gun can accommodate projectiles weighing 7 tons. Just imagine the scale of it all. Essentially, the gun fires projectiles the size of a refrigerator and weighing as much as a real truck, up to a distance of 29 miles. To operate this machine, you need almost 3,000 people. Servicing just the gun requires 250 people and another two and a half thousand are needed to move it. After all, there aren't railways everywhere to reach the destination. Naturally, such a battalion has its own kitchen, camouflage brigade, and even a full-fledged bread factory. Dora is also guarded by two anti-aircraft battalions against air attacks. In general, the Germans created a real city on the railway, which even has its own army. However, whether it was worth it or not, I can't confidently say. The thing is, the gun made its first shot only in 1942. It was used in the attack on Sevastopol. And to get to the place from which it had to fire, new railway tracks had to be laid. In total, Dora fired 48 times. However, the shells rarely hit their target. Essentially, the gun hit the target only once, destroying an ammunition depot in the cliffs. The shells literally stuck in the ground to a depth of 100 feet and exploded there. 
Unfortunately, you won't be able to see this magnificent piece of military engineering live. To prevent the gun from falling into enemy hands, the Germans blew it up when the Allied forces were capturing Germany. As I mentioned, German scientists were some of the best in the world at the time. And it was these engineers who developed the very first ballistic missile in the world. The V-2 also became the first man-made object in history to achieve a suborbital spaceflight. And its dimensions are simply astonishing. The rocket stands at 46 feet tall, weighs almost 14 tons with fuel, and reaches a maximum altitude of 116 miles. At the same time, the speed it attains is simply astronomical. A whopping 3,790 miles per hour. However, its range is not that great only 138 miles. The V-2 rockets were launched either from a stationary or mobile launching platforms. Of the 9 tons of starting mass, nearly all was fuel, which was consumed in the first minute of the rocket's flight. Thanks to this, it reached a speed of 5,500 feet per second in a matter of seconds. The fuel itself consisted of a mixture of liquid oxygen and ethyl alcohol. The first combat launch of the V-2 took place on September 8th, 1944. The target was the capital of England, London. Naturally, no air defense system could shoot down such an advanced and fast missile. However, as it turned out in practice, the V-2 was not very reliable. Approximately half of all launched rockets simply self-destructed, so the development turned out to be very costly, considering that half of them exploded on launch. Moreover, the weapon's accuracy was very poor resulting in its effectiveness being minimal. The missile's hitting accuracy was plus or minus 6 miles, so aiming at the city center, Germans would barely hit the outskirts, let alone important military targets. A 13-ton rocket, which cost a huge amount of money, was as effective as a handgun in the hands of a person, as this behemoth could only harm two or three people at best. According to statistics, out of 2,000 V-2 launches, only 2,700 people were affected. In general, this advanced development became more of a psychological weapon than an effective means of waging war. But the research was not in vain. Engineers and scientists who worked on this project went on to work on NASA's space program in the United States after the war. So it did bring some benefit after all. But the latest development of World War II shocked me because it literally embodied the saying, make do with what you have. In England, the mysteries of the seas, they were actively solving the problem of countering German submarines, which constantly destroyed British ships. Naturally, the losses were simply enormous, which constantly led to a shortage of high-quality steel in the country. But one ingenious inventor, Geoffrey Pike, found a solution to the problem. The scientists developed a new building mixture called Pikrit, Essentially, it was just ice mixed with sawdust. And it's worth nothing, his development was quite impressive. However, the first demonstration tests almost ended in disaster. They shot into a layer of pikrit with a pistol. No, the ice armor was not pierced by the bullet. It ricocheted instead and hit the pants of one of the admirals. Luckily, no one was injured at the time. The tests showed all the advantages of such a development and soon Pike was offered to create the grandest aircraft carrier in history. It was to be called the Habakkuk. The runway was supposed to be 380 miles long, specifically so the ship could accommodate heavy bombers. The width was 300 feet, and the height of the entire vessel was 200 feet. Agree, these are simply colossal dimensions for a floating vessel. The thickness of the ice walls was supposed to be 40 feet, Thanks to such a layer, the aircraft carrier was completely invulnerable to torpedoes. Inside, there would be complex cooling systems so that the ship wouldn't simply melt during movement, as well as powerful electric motors. In general, this monster was supposed to become a real pillar for the British fleet. By December 1943, they even built a large-scale model for testing, which was 380 feet long and 30 feet wide. It was cooled by a gasoline engine with a power of only one horsepower. But, unfortunately, the project was not further developed. Germany was losing the war, and there was little threat to the English fleet. So they decided to abandon the ice carrier. But the effectiveness of the technology was proven. 
Even in one of the episodes of Mythbusters, they tested the ability of such a boat to float, and it held up quite easily. And this fact greatly amazes me. What do you think about the idea of making ships out of ice and sawdust? Write about it in the comments. In this video, I told you about the most interesting, advanced and secret developments of the past that have ever existed in the world. Thanks for watching.